Chapter Twenty Seven of Women in History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Gonzalez. Women in History by Anonymous. Chapter Twenty Seven. Catherine of Aragon. Was first married to Henry the Eighth's elder brother Arthur, who died before he concluded his sixteenth year. Henry the Seventh divided between his policy and his conscience. First contracted her to his son Henry, and afterwards, when the latter reached his fourteenth year, becoming alarmed, insisted on his formally renouncing the engagement. Yet strange as it may appear, this renunciation was not communicated to her father nor to the princess for whose marriage with henry a papal dispensation has been procured meanwhile henry's heart became touched by the amiable qualities of catherine he showed no disinclination to the match and on the third of june about six weeks after his father's death the marriage took place which was afterwards the cause of such important changes it was followed by the ceremony of the coronation performed on excessive cost and with great magnificence the age was one of feudal splendour and a pageant as it has been abridged by an amiable modern historian presents us with a lively and peculiar picture of the times on the day preceding the solemnity the king and queen went from the tower to westminster through the table street streets lined with the city companies in their best display beneath rows of crimson velvet feared with ermine the king wore a coat of raised gold with a tablet shining with rubies, emeralds, great pearls, and diamonds, nine children of honour, and great causes, and dressed in blue velvet, powdered with fleur de lis in gold, presented the nine kingdoms which he governed or claimed England, France, Gascony, Guyenne, Normandy, Anjou, Cornwall, Wales, and Ireland. Following her richly dressed retinue, the queen was seen seated in a magnificent litter or chariot, borne by two milk white palfreys. Her person was clothed in embroidered satin, with her hair hanging down her back at a great length, beautiful and goodly to behold, and on her head a coronal, set with many rich and orient stones. After the procession and coronation had terminated, the jousts and tournament succeeded, and were peculiarly magnificent. The king and queen were stationed in a rich edifice, made within the palace of Westminster, where, from a fountain and its cascades, at many places red, white, and claret wine poured out of mouths of various animals. The trumpets sounded to the field, and the young gallants and noblemen, gorgeously apparelled, entered it, taking up the ground, shaking their horses, and throwing them on their haunches, and they afterwards journeyed together. Time passed. It was now five years since Henry had separated himself from the society of his queen, and solicited a divorce and for three years he had lived in such familiar intercourse with Anne Boleyn, that no doubt could be entertained regarding the nature of connection between them. The situation of the Marchioness of Pembroke at length confirmed this in the most unequivocal manner, and the king, becoming alarmed for the legitimacy of his expected offspring, determined to make her his wife. The marriage was performed, the party separated as quietly as they had assembled, and Viscount Rochefort, was dispatched to communicate the event to the king of france and request him to send a confidential minister to england the divorce from catherine was accomplished for the king by the ingenuity of his counsellors intimation was now sent to catherine that she must in the future be contented with the style of dowager princess of wales all persons were prohibited from giving her the title of queen and her income was reduced to the sum settled upon her by prince arthur her first husband the ungrateful intelligence was conveyed to her personally by Duke of Suffolk, and, considering the general mildness of her deportment, was received in unwanted indignation. She declared that she was, and ever would remain, the Queen, and that before she would renounce that title, she would be hewn in pieces. As to her removal to any other residence, where she was to have a new household, and commence a new life as Princess Dowager, she peremptorily refused to give her her consent. They might bind her with ropes, but willingly she would never go. End of chapter twenty seven.